Hello, and welcome to the 26th annual Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, to bring special attention to the National Grazing Lands Coalition, Food Animal Concerns Trust, Morrison's Custom Feeds, Rural Vermont, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. Please visit all of our sponsors' virtual booths for more information about their work. I'd also like to thank our partners. They help make our work possible throughout the year. The National Institute of Food and Agriculture, United States Department of Agriculture, Cedar Tree Foundation, and the Forest C and Francis H. Lattner Foundation. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about how to use Whova to improve your conference experience. During the sessions, we will take Q&A from the audience. You will submit your Q&A questions under the Q&A tab to the right of the session recording. If you blow the session recording up to full screen, you will lose the tabs to your right. So just remember that you'll have to minimize them, the, the screen, when you have a question in order to put your question in the Q&A tab. You can also see other attendees' questions. This allows the upvoting of questions to increase the likelihood that they will get asked and answered. There is a chat tab here. This is for you and other attendees to share your wisdom. We will also use it to post resources from the presentations. And you will also find the live captioning link here in the chat tab. For the live captioning of each session, you will cut and paste that link into a new browser window. Please use Google Chrome as your browser. There's also a polls tab and a community board tab. The polls tab will provide, will help you provide feedback to the pre presenters and the community board will allow you to connect with other attendees. There are a number of networking features within Whova that helps you connect to other attendees. One new feature is the speed networking sessions. We will be hosting one speed networking session on the 22nd from 11.30 to 12.30. This is an opportunity to, for farmers to sit together and chat at a table, at a virtual table. Every 10 minutes you will be shuffled to a new virtual table, but you'll have a chance to introduce yourself and say hello to new and old friends. You can also email, text, or video call other attendees. You can do this for the next six months. For the next six months, you can host a virtual meetup or create a discussion group on topics of your choice. Again, please use Google Chrome as your browser and you have this a capability for the next six months. Did I mention that you can host a virtual meetup or start a topic discussion group? So this is under your community tab on the left. And there are a number of features where you can start to network with people who have similar questions to your, your questions. Thank you for participating and spending the time with us for the 26th annual Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference. I hope you enjoy the content. Hello, and welcome to Grazing Land You Don't Own, um, a session featuring Lexi Hain and Byron Palmer. Lexi Hain is the executive director of the American Soul and Grazing Association and the co-owner of Agrivoltaic Solutions, LLC, a sheep solar grazing business. Byron Palmer is the co-owner of Grounded Land and Livestock. So this session is gonna be a casual conversation between Lexi and Byron, and I'm gonna ask them questions to keep us kind of on topic. Um, but let's start the session with allowing each of them 
to do a brief introduction of themselves to give you folks some context of who they are. So Lexi, why don't you go first? Thanks for having me, Megan. I have a farm here in central New York. I have some ag background, some energy background, some sustainability background, and that all came together in 20, 2017, 2018. Um, I specifically started a business to graze sheep at solar facilities. So targeted grazing business that has expanded every year. And every year I continue to be delighted when the sheep are grazing with their jobs. They are doing, doing work at, at other people's land. And I am very happy when they all leave the farm. I consider that to be a success. <laughs> so I also, so yes, that's my main business. And I'm happy to talk about that today. I'm happy to banter with Byron. And also my work with the American Solar Grazing Association means I end up navigating all parts of working with the solar industry and working with other farmers around the country, working with researchers. So I'll be happy to speak about that speak about our membership and our issues. Um, we have about 450 members in almost 50 states, and it's a rapidly growing trade association and advocacy group to support people, by and large, grazing, grazing off their own land. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to today. Go ahead, Byron. Yeah, so thanks for introducing me, Megan. Um, you said I uh, I'm co-owner of Grounded Land Crew. Uh, that's my personal business, but I'm mostly speaking here uh, as the grassland manager for a nonprofit here in Sonoma County, California called Sonoma Mountain Institute. Um, as I said, we are located in Sonoma County. Uh, primary crops in my county are wine grapes. They account for about 350 million uh, in production. And then our dairy industry is also you know, decently big. Our second agricultural producer at about 150 million. And then I focus mostly on beef cattle uh, and cattle and calves are down, you know, like fifth, six on the list in terms of production at about 20 million in my county. Uh, my basic focus at Sonoma Mountain Institute as the grazing manager is just regenerating grasslands through management um, using herbivores. And, uh, you know, we have a very robust monitoring program so that we can course correct our management. You know, we've had that program since 2012, and we also use it to communicate to stakeholders. Um, we manage other people's cattle. So we have local cattle, uh, both dairy, um, shortbread, and open dairy heifers from local organic dairies here. And we also manage cattle for other beef operations in California and out to Nevada. Um, collectively, we manage around eight or nine ranches, uh, about 4,800 acres, and that includes private land, um, also public parks. So we manage uh, Sonoma County Regional Parks and uh, also land owned by other nonprofits and institutions. So in an average year, we run around 1,200 to 1,500 head of cattle. Um, they're all yearlings. We don't uh, have cows and calves. Um, and that's yeah, that's that's the that's the summary. I'm sure we'll get into more there, but that's that's the summary. Perfect. Thanks. So um, I'd like each of you to uh, dig a little deeper into the journey that got you to where you are today. So um, we'll start with Lexi again. So go ahead, Lexi. Uh, sure. Um, so I'd say the key element of the journey for this audience was figuring out that it had to be sheep that I was gonna be purchasing for the solar grazing. Um, I'd had some, a variety of farm animals like 10 years earlier. And so I, it wasn't my first time owning sheep, but it was information from the grazing program manager at North Carolina State, um, as well as researching the best practices of the British National Solar Center that made me go, oh, this, this will definitely be sheep. Um, don't be, you know, I wasn't tempted by um, cattle, goats, chickens, um, all of those other types of animals that can be managed on pasture, um, I think have their place 
um, and mm, the solar industry is developing and changing rapidly enough right now that I anticipate there will be some accommodations made for those other kinds of creatures. But I'd say that my key learning was so sort of like 2016, I did a bunch of research, 2017, buying my starter flock of sheep. Um, I bought hair sheep um, and realizing that it was, I was like, oh good, I can, you want to start with a flock. I know I'm going to have to grow this flock. I will know that I'm going to have to have enough income so that I can, and, and also rely on savings to start so I can retain more of the flock than I might normally. Um, so in the beginning, it was a grow, grow, grow strategy. And I think last year I was at like about 150 U's and sort of started selling my first, I didn't retain weathers, but started selling my first like U lambs. Cause I thought, okay, I've kind of hit this mark where I want to be personally and what our farm and our family can sustain. That was important to me, but a bunch of years I had to be able to say, I'm not going to get much income from lambs. And I also have to be able to mobilize and transport my animals. And I'm here in the Northeast, like you, I also have to be able to feed them all winter long. Um, starting this past year, it's like, okay, I'm also going to get some income now from really selling selling more of the sheep and stabilize parts of the business and stop buying so much that was expensive. I did also a bunch of other farm improvements that we can talk about later, but you know, there was a growth trajectory where you kind of have to go, can I forego income for a little while? Um, the other part, and we can talk about it, but the other key to my strategy was I took on a business partner pretty early on who was a grass-based sheep farmer um, who was also interested in solar grazing. We partnered at the end of the day, he is going to have the much larger flock of sheep. He has the capacity, the time, and the interest. So we're working together with our sheep um, to fulfill our contracts. And finally, we also figured out how, in some cases, to subcontract using other um, grass-based um, sheep farmers who are willing to, you know, fulfill all the requirements of what is needed in solar grazing. So I'll pause with that, but that shows a little bit of how we grew our business and where it's going, which is there's a ton of demand. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Byron. I was I was mute. I muted myself. My wife wish, wishes she had that button available for me. Um, I so do you, it, the question just how we got started is that. Yeah, your journey to where you are right now, just to give us okay. some context. Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll start mine a little bit farther back. Um, my great grandparents, no, I'm not gonna go that far back, but I grew up, so I grew up in the suburbs, which I think is worth mentioning. I didn't grow up in agriculture. I grew up in a little town called Alameda, which is in the San Francisco Bay area, about two minutes outside of Oakland. And I didn't grow up around agriculture at all. I grew up riding my bike and causing trouble, if anyone is familiar with that, you know, type of behavior. And eventually I went to college, um, mostly to play football. Uh, and I was super obsessively annoying about how hard I worked at that. And uh, eventually I got injured because, you know, football is a game that human beings should not be playing with their bodies. Um, and I needed somewhere to put that obsessive behavior. And I put it into my work ethic with school and read some books. I hadn't really read any books before. I don't know if you guys have read books, I don't know if anybody on the call uh, or on the at the program has read books. If you do, you'll figure out pretty fast that the earth is on fire. And I was like, oh, shit, that's not good. And uh, so when I got out of school, I decided, you know, the problem was that people didn't know the earth was on fire because I didn't know, you know, so I got involved in documentary filmmaking um, so that I could tell people the earth was on fire and I thought I'll just show up, you know, with all my whiteness and maleness and privilege and I'll just yell. I'll be like, hey, we're burning this place up. Let's stop doing that shit. And then everyone will stop. Um, as you can see, that did not work uh, because the earth is still burning. And during that time in documentary filmmaking, I essentially spent a lot of time on farms. And I realized that I wanted to be directly involved in that process, not just documenting it. So um, I spent the next five years in my mid-20s doing apprenticeships and internships and uh, 
different programs to sort of develop those skills and those competencies. And there's a lot in there, but eventually I ended up managing a CSA um, that had 600 customers when I showed up. So relatively large CSA and I helped grow it to a thousand customers. We did pork, beef, chicken, and eggs pretty quickly uh, trying to make that business profitable. I realized that I wanted nothing to do with direct marketing at scale because that is an inventory and logistics competency neither of those I am interested in. And so I went, I left and I got snabbed up by Sonoma Mountain Institute where I, where I've worked since 2013 as their grassland manager. And in that program, when I started in 2000 and uh, we had two properties, 500 acres, and I've since, you know, supported and managed, you know, written the contracts, negotiated acquisition of nine ranches, 4,800 acres, um, and, you know, help build out the program from a hundred head, to, you know, 1500 head. And next year we're probably on track to run 2000, 2500 head. So, you know, learned a lot in that time, a lot of really bad days, uh, that turned into competencies. What I always tell, tell the guys on my crew, if the day sucks, you're going to get better. Um, even though none of us want to get better. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a little bit starting with my grandparents and, uh, my hubris and, uh, the grind and direct marketing and, now we're just, you know, moving herbivores around landscapes and uh, trying to increase biodiversity and, you know, get that Jurassic Park grass going. Yeah, both of you talk a little bit about um, the, like Lexi, you mentioned, you know, can these, can people, you know, meet our, the, the criteria, what we need and, and Byron, I'm sure that you've got a landowner's expectations. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about those things. Like what are, what do, to be grazing land you don't own, what are some of the things that um, the criteria is the expectations on you that, you know, other people have to follow for you, Lexi, and for Byron that, that you have to abide by? Okay, I'll start with like some official contract stuff that's more formal. And then I think we should finish with like manure, you know, and that's a good lead right to Byron, I think. So um, we're, we'll start with, you know, the very first project. This is where like my American Solar Grazing Association, my ASGA hat comes on because our first project, um, <laughs> basically after like we bought a website and then we got sponsored by... Uh, a law clinic at Pace University. And with that, we built the solar grazing contract. And we built that, it was a collaboration between, you know, the handwritten solar grazing contract I was using and a bunch of other people like donated anonymously, like here's what I use to work with solar companies. And then we actually had a couple universities who were often the early adopters have these like, bomb proof legal documents that were like 50 pages long. I don't even know. So our law clinic worked with us, some of our founder members to be like, can we make this scope? And can we spell out what these expectations are? You know, are the sheep going to be there all winter long? Who's bringing water to the sheep? Does the solar company supply water? How about fences? Like who maintains the fences? Why are there fences? Are there fences, both perimeter and interior? So there's like a lot to what I just said, but suffice it to say, we formalize that into a contract template. Um, I myself have signed contracts last year. We grazed, I don't know, 75 acres with that very contract. I was handed by a solar company like here. And I was like, oh my God, this is too funny. So and every year we work on improving it. So like just to this audience, love to have your participation. Let me know, reach out to me. We'd love to have more grazers voices, but that scope of work, which is started as a vegetation management scope of work has expanded into a, well, sometimes the farmer grazers might also want to do the snow plowing to sometimes the farmer grazers might want to repair that perimeter fence when the trees fall down. Sometimes, so there's like other and income. They, want to. Well, they like, might want to. <laughs> they might want to. Uh, there could be income. They might want to do all this stuff that we should be doing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, there's there's like definitely other line items in the solar firm's budgets for all this other site maintenance. 
And so we can opt in as like, if you have the capacity and like also want a snowplow and you also want to do light civil work, boom, go for it. Like add that into your bid. So it's really about like, it's a bidding and land management job. Um, the other part that's going to be more interesting to this crowd and more sophisticated is like evaluation of the qualities of the forage, seeds and site selection, and looking at, you know, overall, like what are the site conditions for, from a grazer's perspective? That is something the solar industry is a lot newer to. I've tried to help them a little bit. Um, I have been working with NRCS in New York and Pennsylvania largely to like look at PCS pasture condition score sheets, like let's assess this and let's have the grazers have these like metrics. Cause the metric that the solar company cares about shade is there shade on our panels. If there's shade on our panels, there's a problem. Okay. Lastly, manure. They don't want poop on their inverter pads. They don't want poop in giant piles at the entrance to the solar site. They're, they're technicians. So right, like in a healthy functioning solar array, you got technicians that come out a couple times a season. They always go to typically the same places. They're going to the places where these like inverters are and this other like transformer equipment. If the sheep are lying there and they're pooping all day long, they are very unhappy. So you have to like build exclusion fences. But yes, there are some other little nuances you learn the people who are electrical technicians do not like standing in livestock manure. And with that, Byron. Oh, so funny. So many similarities. Megan, do you want to go ahead? And I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the question, but could you restate it? Because I could talk about 18 different things related to this subject, but I want to make sure I knock out what you actually intend. Yeah, I was just talking about what the expectations are that you deal with from the landowners or, it, you know, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the different landowners. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but it seemed like yeah. we were talking about what our land management priorities were and how that wraps into the landowners expectations. Yeah, so for sure. Yeah, I, I think it's super important, you know, in any conversation to zoom out. Right. And like contextually say, where are we? What are we doing? Like, for instance, hang on, that's a baby monitor. Like right now I'm at my house and I have a baby that's crying and the monitor's on. So I'm going to go turn that off. Hold on one second. Okay. It's all happening. It's all happening. Hold on here. Sorry. This is real life, you know? Hold on one sec. Oh, there we go. All right. So zooming back, babies, context. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for watching a recording. I know it's not as fun if we're there. Um, so I think it's super important to understand the context, right? So in my area, there is a distinct difference between what we do, which is we graze large tracts of land versus what all of our friends that do goats and sheep for vegetation control do. Because typically, um, you know, those animals uh, that are on, let's say, dry uh, morbidun material that has a negative nutritional value and the animals like it's pressing the animals hard. Right. And we show up to manage biodiversity. We're not managing, we're not dealing with this problem of thatch that should have been managed in our area in March. Right. So contextually looking up the, the needs or requirements are going to be specific to the context and the type of landowner you're working with and the type of problem you solve. We're the person you call when you've got 500, 1500, 2000 acres that you wanted, you want to increase the natural capital and you want to manage for biodiversity. And you also have a little bit of petunias you need fencing out, right? You're going to ask things that traditional operators are just not going to do like fencing out the inverters. We do, we have sort of like our version of that, right? Um, but in terms of the requests, you know, for instance, when we manage uh, county parks, public parks, we need to be able to operate in a safe way with hundreds of people walking through animals that weigh 800 pounds. And these people are going to be on cell phones. They're going to be, you're, it's amazing how much people can scroll while walking up a 45 degree slope. It is fascinating. And so you're, you're, you're expected to keep these people safe. You're expected to keep the animals safe in a context where people aren't going to behave um, 
behave according to whatever your standards might be. Like you might think it's completely reasonable to close a gate after you walk through it. That's a very reasonable assumption. Unfortunately, your assumption has no relationship to reality about what the general public's going to do. So you can't manage behavior, but you can manage infrastructure. So you need to make sure your gate self-close. You need to make sure you have cattle guards. You need to make sure that the infrastructure is smarter than the people, because if your whole plan is dependent upon making people behave a certain way. So, you know, keeping people safe, keeping animals safe, super important. Um, we have people that need us to fence out a variety of things. Zooming back out contextually, this also matters like where you're at in your career, right? So if you're at an earlier phase in your career and you're developing a portfolio, maybe you're willing to acquiesce to more stakeholder demands, you know, but it, when we were early on, we'd fence out like a hundred individual fruit trees, right? If someone told me they needed me to do that shit now, like I'd have to like stifle a giggle and give them some options about how they were going to have to deal with that. But if I was at the beginning stage of my career and didn't have a portfolio contextually, I might have to do some, do some more of that, that we did earlier, early on in the career, you know? Um, and yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many different like threads to go on, but um, we also have to manage which I would say, and this falls into the category of a number of the things I was saying is just recreation, right? On our places, if there's 500 acres or a thousand acres, 1500 acres, you're going to have recreation and that recreation sort of pivoting back to a previous commentary, you know, people are, they're not going to leave gates the way they find them. They're going to turn off the water to your animals because they broke a pipe and they want to turn off the water and they don't know it goes to your animals. Um, they're going to drive through your cattle at like 30 miles an hour on a side by side with their dog running and it's going to like chase the cattle and then they're going to laugh and take a video. You know, I mean, this like, this is the structural reality. Like it would be great if people didn't do these things, but this people don't live in our context and we don't live in theirs, you know, and maybe they really needed that video that day. Um, so the, we, we have to manage all these different things, depending on the context. Are we in a public park? Is it a private use? I've got a situation. We're on a private landowner right now next to my home ranch. He's got a birthday party on Friday, 30 people coming over. They're going to be in gates, out of gates, we're going to move them off the ranch because like, that's just, I mean, I know when I'm, when I'm, you know, a little bit lit off a few drinks, like maybe I'm not thinking about the, you know, maybe I'm always thinking about the gates. That's, that's not true, but I can imagine how one would not be thinking about the gates. So we're going to move them off. So yeah, we're constantly responding to those demands. We can talk more about the structures of how we do that. You know, I could get into that. I, there's some really helpful tools about front end management of that. If you want to get into logistics of that, happy to talk about it. But that's kind of like a brief summary. Brief for me, that's brief. That could have gone for like three hours. No, that's great. And we will probably get like pepper some of these ideas back in. But it also just led me to thinking too about are there things that you give your landowners like at the end of the year or like are there, do they have like reporting expectations of you um, and maybe we'll circle back around and go the other way. Um, Byron, do you have things that you like deliver to your landowners about your hard time? Strong opinions, <laughs> excessive selfies. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, we definitely do have things we give. Um, I think this cycles back to something kind of Lexi alluded to. And I think is probably if there's only one thing that someone watching this takes away, the most important thing I can say for managing other people's land is that you need to know what is most important to them and manage accordingly because your perception of your work and your process and all the cool books you read and all the workshops we've been to, right. And your own belief in your process actually has no physical representation in their brain. Like you could do the best you could make, 8,000% more plants grow there. But if you shit on the inverters, they don't care, right? Like they don't care. So I call it managing the driveway, right? Like you need to manage the driveway. You need to manage the view shed. To them, the most important thing might be don't use my tools. And if you do ask, and if you do ask and put them back, right? And it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, how easy it is to uh, 
think that other people need to understand your process, like how easy it is to be like, we're doing such a great job. Can't you see all these things? And it's like, look, man, I don't really care what you do. As long as you don't shit on the inverters and the grass is not standing over the solar panels. You could do anything else. You know, you could bring a jump house. You could bring a bounce house house for your shepherds. Like, I don't care. Just those two things. Right. And so in answer to your question, making sure that you manage those things ongoing, I know you're talking about like end of the year reporting or something like that. Um, but the most important thing is whatever your design for your end of the year thing is that it addresses what their most important thing is and it communicates them. Parks, biodiversity is big. We have monitoring. We monitor the parks. Um, am I coming through okay, Megan? Right you now? just you just blanked out a little bit, which is okay. kind of fun. Like I don't have to bleep you. You just you're, you're it just bleep does, you, but it just bleeps I haven't yourself. even heard. Yeah, this I know. Is so. PG. This is PG. <laughs> this is totally PG. Uh, so um, it just blinked out like a, just second, go back yeah. a tiny bit ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. So for instance, for the parks, managing biodiversity is really important. So we we pay for monitoring of the parks. We have monitoring points. And then we put together, we don't do this every year, but we have in the past put together a photo book before and after with vegetation monitoring data, put it on the desk of everybody, executive director on the desk, you know, all the operations people on the desk. That's an example of something we'll do. Um, that's been huge, right? Because people aren't going to go out there for the most part. Those people that I talked about, they might. A lot of the time people aren't going to get out there and see. So you need before and after photos. And we also do annual reports from time to time, depending on what's culturally needed at the moment in that space, right? It's all these things are very expensive in terms of time and effort to do. So it's kind of like spinning plates. You're like, where do we need the most relationship attention? You know, so those are, those are a couple of the things we do. And I guess the last thing I'll say is making sure you have a regular cadence. So like there can be a big action and a big lift. But you need like a stitch in time saves nine. So whoever your contact person is. Okay. And kosher on your place because we're on so Byron, many. You, you glitched again. So you, it oh, was whoever your sorry. contact person is. That's oh yeah. Sorry. So yeah, this is why I wanted to do the recording. My internet so bad. <laughs> but if, if your contact person, if your contact, per, you need to be in regular communication with your contact person because a stitch in time saves nine. So if you're doing something at that site, that might be normal on your site and five other sites, but there is a big no-no and they don't tell you, like, even if you do an end of the year report, you spent three months like doing something they hate, but they didn't want to reach out. Right. So it's important to maintain regular communication. And I have all of our, all of our people that manage our sites are, they know they like reach out to us immediately. Like if we drove in the wrong place, if we left the gate open, not that we're going to be able to do everything. But we want to know real time when it happens and not wait through the end. So managing for that one thing that's really important and also having a regular cadence of communication so that we can nip it in the bud before it becomes a, a point of like ongoing resentment that we don't even know is existing, you know? Yeah, thanks. Um, and so Lexi, we were talking about, you know, what are, what are the things that you report back to with your, with your landholders? So interestingly, I work with no landowners. <laughs> I work with the leaseholders who are the solar companies. But just a just a note, there are also landowners. And sometimes those landowners are like, you'll never see them. You don't know where they are. Maybe they were absentee to begin with. Other cases, your landowners might be in the farmhouse next door. It might be like this super cute couple who literally send you texts on every major holiday and happy Thanksgiving and everything and send you pictures of your sheep and send you updates of your sheep um, pretty much every day they're on your solar site. And then also tell you when the sheep are missing because you've brought them home and then tell you they miss the sheep. So it depends on the site. <laughs> Sometimes these landowners are sweet, engaged and their retirement project is um, keeping you informed on your flock. And you're like, can I pay you? And they're like, no. So then you figure out they like lamb and like things are better. Um, uh, other thoughts on like what you do reporting this and that, I'd say there's just a few basic rules. Like 
you're working for the energy industry, different people in the energy industry take that with different levels of seriousness. Um, so that risk management side on their front, you know, they have to, some of them are like, yes, we would love to have livestock in our multi, in our hundred million dollar solar array. And others are like, oh my God. So trust building and trust building means um, we do a lot of outreach and I've given so many solar site tours, but that's how I, I mean, it's not, I guess it's a replicable model. It's like take, said asset manager or whatever the decision maker's title is to some of the other sites that you're already managing. And if you don't have any yet, bring them to your home farm. Make sure your home farm looks as tidy as you can make it and then walk them around, kind of give them a sense of like what's important to them and what's important to you. So there's like some of these people will be really clear with you that the only thing that matters to them is like no shade and cost. Other people want to use you as like their marketing friend for the next five years and have school groups and camp groups out to your solar facility. They want pictures every time a lamb is born on your solar site. They want, they want to buy all your lamb meat as part of your contract, like whatever. But there is a really big range. And so just building trust and figuring out who the key decision makers are, super important. Um, kind of lastly, and you know, Byron's lucky enough to work and live with people who like seem to value biodiversity. Um, the key component in the solar industry right now isn't yet biodiversity. It's sort of like a nice to have, or yes, we're working on this as part of our corporate like strategy. Um, but for other people, like if the place is covered in invasive species and if the invasive species is shorter than the panels, they're going to go like, oh, good deal. So that whole side is like completely a little mind blowing. If you're like me, not like learn, okay, it's like, you can see the little explosions already happened mostly, but just know that like, that's where it's like, figure out what those expectations are. And like Byron said that they may have nothing to do with what you have read or know. <laughs> Go ahead. Byron. Byron. <laughs> oh no, I just, yeah, I just, yep. You already, you already said it. You all it's, right. Go ahead. Am I keep? Is it pretty bad? No, nah, it's, it's every time you talk. <laughs> just every time I talk. Just every time I talk. Yeah, I have that. I have that effect. Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, I do not. Know, I do not know what's happening right now. Yeah, we can zoom me. I can zoom in on a phone. We can get real weird. You know, that'll be that'll be super fun for folks. No, no, just, just reiterating what Lexi said, just, and I think this is the basic being a human being shit, right? Like your perception of reality has no bearing on other person's perception of reality and do not get confused with your opinions and perceptions in your site analysis, right? The site analysis is key. And regardless of how fantastic you think you are and how much your mom said you're awesome, uh, you know, mine said I was awesome a lot. She said it yesterday. It really has no bearing, you know, like if some people just want the invasives X high, like under the panels, that doesn't mean you have to manage for that. Or even that it's your job. Maybe that conflicts with your values and what you're willing to take on. That's okay. Just, just, but if you want the job, want the job, then just, you know, you got to manage accordingly. Yeah. So this brings me to the like, how do you take on new landowners or or land lease people? Like, how do you decide to uh, take on a new piece of land? Go ahead, Lexi. We'll go the other way around now. Sure. Okay. So I'm in a position where, yeah, I can I can pick a little bit more. I can be pickier, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back and say, as if I'm like someone in this audience who's sort of considering doing this. Some things I would do would be like, are you talking to the right decision maker? Are you talking to the people who you can actually think you can negotiate for right now, who maybe are gonna have control of this project for the next five or 10 years? So I rec in the solar industry right now, it's complex, but basically if you can work with people who you can then know that you haven't invested, this could go a few years, that's one factor. Um, another factor for me is distance from home, size of facility. 
Um, solar can be in New York right now, you know, it's like from four acres to generally less than a hundred acres, but that's about to change and it's about to change pretty fast. But distance, I'm not willing to graze an array that's four acres and mm, more than five minutes from my house. But you might be, if it's right, you know, I don't know your business model, but that's it. Size of the earth. Water. Where's the water? Am I hauling the water? Is there water on site? Is there water right next door so I can fresh fill up water for them? So those are some big ones. Integrity of the perimeter fence. Federal law, they need those perimeter fences. However, will it keep your sheep in and will it keep everyone else's pet dogs out? Best to walk a site, okay? So that's my big thing. If it's already built, feel free to take an afternoon or five minutes and whatever and poke around and see what you're about to get into. And absolutely, you don't even, I mean, I'm not, I'm on a public thing. So I'll just say best to get permission, but by and large, if it's already constructed, you can walk around the outside and get a good sense of what you're signing up for. Um, there's probably some other key things, but those I'll stop with that and Byron and I'll probably forgotten 20 things. So go ahead, Byron. <laughs> Yeah. So just, just, uh, will you repeat the question again, Megan, just so I, cause there's about 80 things that Lexi said that I want to talk about. And so I, <laughs> I want to go off on a wild ass goose chase. What do you got for me again? I was just asking, you know, how do you take on new land? Yeah. Do you, how do you make the decision to take on yeah. new land? Yeah. Once again, like zooming out context matters. And if this, if this starts getting choppy, just hold up a finger, you can stop me with a, like a pump fist or eh, whatever. Uh, Context matters. Where are you at in your career? Like, are you building a portfolio? Can you pick and choose like, like Lexi can at this point? Um, for us, uh, really, it's about scale. And, um, you know, is it big enough to support the resources that are going to need to go to manage it, right? Everything that Lexi just said is a resource ask. That's money. That's time. That's calories that human beings have to spend. Why does it matter? Because if there's bad water, if there's bad fencing, if there's bad neighbors, like another way to talk about those things is like this, cha-ching, 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 because you need to price them in. And if you don't price them in, you're, or you're going to lose your sanity. You lost me? Where'd you lose me at? We're good. We're back. If you don't price them in, if you don't price them in, you're going to lose your money or sanity, right? And so they're not going to price it in for you. They have no idea of how important these various things may be. And they're just going to think, oh, it's a site like any other. They're going to see some sort of like metric somewhere and think that it applies, right? But it's, it's important to, to do these things that Lexi was talking about because they matter in terms of um, money uh, and time and energy. For us, what that means in our context specifically, if it's contiguous, maybe 250, 300 acres. If it's not contiguous, it's got a you know minimum 500 and maybe it has to have strategic value and just like Lexi said then it's you know how's the infrastructure usually if it's available just like FYI if you like it it's not a freaking accident everybody likes it if it's got good perimeter fences and water it's easier right and so a thing that's almost never going to happen is this conversation. Hey, I've got this beautiful ranch. It's an entire economic unit. All the infrastructure is good to go. There's great water. There's great perimeter fences. There's great interior fences. I've got a loader you can use. Happy, happy to use my ATV. Please come in. You know, like that shit doesn't happen. Where there's opportunity is when there's bad perimeter fence, when there's bad water in my context, right? And so my core competency has to be looking at the hole and walking, you know, I've got over 30 linear miles of perimeter fence, right? It's like, we got to go out there. We got to kick the tires. And my core competency has to be understanding how to move resources, whether NRCS, landowner, or ours, understanding whose resource it should be, given what the ask is, right? And taking a poorly infrastructure-based location that may have potential and fixing it up. You know, it's just like, if it's a three bedroom house that's turnkey on the market, it's going to go quick three bedroom, four bedroom, right? Like, because families just want to move in, it's going to be priced accordingly. What's still on the market is that like spooky ass two bedroom that you're not sure if someone got murdered in. And if you can turn that around, you know, you can make money. That's where the opportunities are. 
right? So for us, it's, it's looking at the economic component. It's looking at the energy component and understanding all those things Lexi said is important because then you know how to price whatever you're doing, you know, and you might be willing to take it in the teeth on the front end of your career. But at this point, everybody's competing with time for my daughter and my son. That's just like flat out a contextually important thing. And so, you know, and I would go back to something else that I think Lexi mentioned that's important. And it's probably the most important thing. Do you want to work with the people? Like, are they a pain in the ass? If they're a pain in the ass at this point, like no dice, you know, and if they start nickel and diming you on the front end in the conversation, if they start saying, oh, that seems really expensive. It's like expensive to what? Like, are you going to transport some sheep here and haul water and all these problems? People that nickel and dime you on the front end, in my experience, will continue to do it. They won't try to understand you and they're going to be a huge pain in the butt. So probably the single most important thing is we really like all of our partners and they're enjoyable to work with. I'll just follow quickly on that. The two things I've really worked hard to help the solar industry understand is the, the this is a fee for service. There's no free grass that's going to make me go to your solar facility ever. And nor will it make any of the rest of us go to your solar facility and do this work. So just knowing that like one, I've been trying to like generally be like, we all have professional standards and I'm not doing it for free, but I do. I, my only comment on that, it's not nickel and diming, but what I find is sometimes people will start, this just happened like this past week. Some, some folks who are building, you know, I don't know, hundred to thousand acre arrays in the upper Midwest were like, okay. And it was a, it was a low offer per acre, but it was like, they at least understood that's the direction the money's going to flow. So I was like, okay, maybe they just need a little education. So sometimes I am willing because this is an emerging field and an emerging market. So that's the thing I, I would just like to say also is that there's enough new people entering the game in solar and just more broadly that you sometimes do need to take, I take the time to educate and be like, okay, well, um, X, Y, Z, these are the range that I see for these sites. And we have a solar grazing budget on our website. We've kind of worked hard to respond because we're like, um, yeah, we have real costs and no lamb doesn't pay for all this. And, you know, you all have expectations and yes, you know, whatever. The other thing I want to just emphasize is we are competing with landscapers. So that's where the other side of like what their dollars there, there are budgets and on those Excel sheets, I've seen them, you know, it's like, oh, oh yeah, there's a line item in here. They're going to pay someone for vegetation maintenance. Is it a traditional, you know, is it a guy in his garage with a, with a two cycle engine? Maybe. Or is it like a fancy O&M firm? Maybe. Either way, like the grazers are up against a professional mechanical only setup and also mechanical herbicide to be continued. Thanks. Yeah, I that on in our area, you know, a common pattern of a landowner is somebody maybe with 20 acres or 40 acres or 50 acres and they reach out to us and part of that education that we have to support them through is that they see that grass as a asset when actually it is a liability because at 20 or 30 acres um, that is literally just waiting to burn in the summer in California, right? But because they think that a grazing animal can eat on it, that there's an inherent value in it. And, and to a certain extent, that's kind of true, but the infrastructure required to make all that happen, the relationships, the competencies like that are built up over a lifetime, those are expensive, right? And so a lot of the work we, I do is trying to support landowners to understand, right? Once again, pick picture context. We're, we're not we're probably not the right tool for you guys. And if you want someone to graze this, you're going to have to pay them because there's not the, the value of this grass cannot deal. It can't even pay for the transportation of these sheep over here. You know, like it's, it's a thing, you know? So that's, that's a super important distinguishing characteristic to make about educating and supporting landowners through the process of understanding. Now, as it gets bigger, like hundred thousand acres solar array, now, all of a sudden, those economics might change of scale, just like for us, if 
you know, if it's a really big ranch and it has great, amazing grass, all of a sudden, you know, it might start paying for some of the management and we can price that in. But it's just a, it's kind of a polishing point, distinguishing feature that's important to consider. Uh, so we're kind of touching on it and um, uh, is it's sort of my question about how, how many sites do you manage at once with, and like, do you split your herds or flocks and what kind of infrastructure do you move from place to place versus what is required to be there on site for your management? Um, who wants this one first? All right, Lexi, we'll go to you. Sure. So every year, my business partner and I, we drop a spreadsheet with our sites and we figure all this out because you have to keep track. So we keep track of who the owner is, like name of the solar company. We keep track of the number of acres each array is at. We give some kind of sense of the address. Maybe it's the county we're working on. Um, and then we also have like a site name. They're all named, typically they're named after like a nearby road or something. Um, and then we say like, who's, who's gonna graze it? We figure it out. Um, and every year, expands um i'd have to look it's like 20 maybe we we're at 25 sites last year or something and i think it's about 1400 sheep on about 500 and some acres you know that kind of scale um but every year it takes and then it, the additional thing there is and i you know encourage you to get grazing plans i use a i use an online tool as well but i always have a like sheep moving to solar moving to you know like i have a planned rotation for the flocks um we don't mix flocks um we do occasionally lease flocks but um we do actually just have a plan of like okay here's a circuit of these four solar arrays in this two county area um let's look at a managed grazing rotation where we can get the sheep between the sites in enough time that we are still in compliance with those directives and with our contracts. Um, if not, maybe we've split the flock up. I find it's a great time. I tend to winter lamb. And so it's like, oh, it's a great time. You know, you've got these, um, you've got all your lambs over here. You've got your male lambs here. You've got your female lambs there on maybe a couple smaller sites that are closer. Maybe you've kept some home and you've got your ewes, you're drying them off and then they're dry and they're out on the, the solar. By and large, it is dry use doing this, um, by the way. Um, people people are to figure out the lambs. The trick with the lambs is the lambs will be big enough to make a freaking dent um, in like a May, June amount of forage, right? So some tricks to all this. But um, I think that was part of, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> Uh, uh, what, what infrastructure do you like move place oh, to place and yeah. what kind do you have actually needs to be there for oh, you? Right. you kind of talked a little bit about some of this, but. Uh, sure, I'll just kind of make a list. Um, interior paddock fencing. Um, I don't graze any sites that has it. So I have to bring it. Um, Electronet, polywire, depends on what your sheep are trained to, but I anticipate bringing it. That may not always be true. I can talk about that. New York State is actually right on the starting to make a kind of grazing friendly sites part of their solar siting process, which is freaking dreamy. Um, like uh, mineral feeders, uh, water, um, usually it's water containers. Uh, sometimes I do crafty things with, you know, more water containers because the solar collects water and it drips off the edge and it refills in those summer storms. So I'll, I'll put a couple extra containers out there. Um, you gotta get the sheep there. You know, some people graze right next to their home farm and solar graze. I'm super jealous of them because all they do is open a gate. Um, guardian animals, um, sometimes. So I've, I've actually only had to use guardian animals like meh, twice. That's a sign that maybe you your fences aren't as good as they really need to be. Um, but you got to bring them there and then you got to check them way more often. Mm, yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff you're bringing. Uh, energizers. Mm, yeah. And then dogs, you're bringing herding dogs there as part of your, mo you know, mobilization mustering. You know, I, I think sheep are a great excuse to own a lot of dogs and spend money on them in their training. 
but other people might have other reasons for owning sheep. I don't know. Hmm. Pirate, go ahead. What it, what it, I, I've been on your one of your places and I found some of the equipment that, um, sorry, my cat feeder just went like the life. Um, this is reality. Uh, so yeah, you have some interesting equipment that moves and, but then you are, what do you have that needs to be in place? Yeah. So, um, once again, I think zooming out big picture, if this is work you want to do, uh, this, you, your competitive advantage lies in your ability to, um, like have the right infrastructure and right resources to make it safe and go smoothly. Um, and you know, one of the, I have a lot of friends that do sheep grazing for, uh, for doing vegetation control. And one of the defining features of, you know, the difference is, is like, you can make sheep do stuff you want to physically, right? You can like pick one up and put it in a place when an 800 pound animal doesn't want to do that shit. You are not making it do that shit. And so your infrastructure answer to your question we have oh it looks like it says my connection was unstable there for a second am i back yes it keeps telling me i'm unstable and i can't sometimes i feel like i read that as emotionally unstable which feels both so uh well, i'm back all right so we have um we have four sites right we have four sort of big contiguous land bases and we have anywhere from a hundred thousand pound animal units to 400,000 pound animal units on these sites. We try really hard to have infrastructure that is strong and can be taken off site. So it's not a permanent capital improvement and fixture, but, um, but it is strong because we do have mobile corral. So things like mobile corrals, you know, uh, for sheep, that'd be porta yards. Um, for us, that's, that might be rawhide or arrow quip or, you know, there are mobile corrals. They're great, kind of, unless you need to really use them for complicated things, right? So we use freestanding corral panels, which are big across the West. They weigh 800 pounds. You can move them with the loader. Um, they've got like a big foot and cattle can't get out of them and they're safe for everybody. So we have those on site everywhere. Um, they're also a store of value you know, like they're an asset. I could sell them for 40% more than I bought them for. Like just, you know, everything goes up. So we have mobile corrals. We have everything is usually at least able to put on a trailer. I've got a mobile squeeze for the cattle. We've got mobile corrals. We've got mobile alleys, but we try to make, because our units are big and our context is different. We try to make sure we have really good handling facilities, including being able to sort the cattle well at all of our places. Um, are the way that I think about choring is like you're in for us like it's half an hour to a ranch or something like that so you're in 100 150 bucks minimum anytime you show up and even if there's not a problem so anyways we can reduce that so we have last year in the drought in California which is one of the worst droughts in our history I mean I can't even talk about how stressful that was but I'm watching spring flows decrease like real time and cattle like pushing troughs we've got game cameras on the cattle trough, right? Real-time monitoring, four photos a day, sending it. So those are barn owl cameras that we use. We've got fence alarms, right? Fence alarms, electronic fence monitoring. I get a text message or the guys on my crew get a text message if the fence drops below a certain voltage, right? So we try to use technologies that reduce choring that doesn't need necessarily to be there. Because a lot of the time, if you show up, then nothing, you know, like figuring out how often to go is, is hard. We go two to three times a week, depending on the context um, and depending on what happened that week, depending on what's going on with the health of the animals and, and all that. So yeah, those are all, those are, those are all some pretty key uh, pieces of infrastructure that we use. Great. Thanks. Um, and uh, we're getting, we're like 10 minutes left. Um, so I, I do just want to quickly ask you the one question, like who, what, what takes more of your time? Uh, managing your landowners or lease the leases, your animals, your markets, the suppliers, the bankers, like who do you spend more time with? And, you know, I think we always think the animals, but as they're like, maybe the second most time <laughs> might be something else or managing them, but yeah. 
Uh, Byron, why don't you take this one first? Yeah, I'm, you know, I would say, I would say besides, besides the animals and besides our crew, say landowners and similar to, yeah, we went out. Where'd you lose me? Like everywhere, but I think you were saying landowners, like besides your animals and your crew. Okay. Landowners. Yeah. Such a, this is such a 2020, 20. So, so yeah, yeah. We'll just keep rocking. Yeah. So um, landowners and land-based users. So kind of like Lexi was talking about earlier with those technicians on site, like we have so much access on so many of our different places, meaning like we have comms towers on one of the county parks and every day there's, co- there's communicate like big, you know, Verizon towers, right? So there's guys uh, rocking up there and doing all kinds of the work. And then every private land piece that we manage has multiple contractors or people on site, right? And so being in communication with the landowners, like, hey, don't, don't turn off the water. Hey, cattle are, you know, you, you have to front end communicate. Looks like I'm unstable again, which is a place I feel very, I feel very mediumly unstable. Um, you have to front end communicate again and again and again. Like you, if at least I do, I, I'll say you, but you know, the proverbial you, I say you, I mean me, you can't r- imagine that someone is going to like think about the five different stakeholders that are going to use their place and they're going to individually communicate to all of them. They're going to do their best, you know? So I, I spend a lot of time talking to landowners and stakeholders on the land, like, hey, we're coming through. We're going to herd cattle through your front yard. Please don't have your dogs running around, you know, like, hey, we're going to just so much effort. And part of the, the hardest part of the job is that there's institutional. Yep, there's institutional memory. Sorry, I was going to say one of the things have happened and where we are know with that particular landowner so just making sure i'm communicating where we're at in the journey relative to where we want to be is it's just yeah very time consuming byron i i gotta tell you i'm not gonna buy cattle and move to california and compete with you i think i think you're apparently doing an amazing job with customer management and i've been um dissuaded from attempting to do anything like it Yep. But, but, th- but th- this was very educational. I'm, I'm really glad I, I attended. Oh yeah. And also in the solar industry, I spend gobs and gobs of time working broadly with the solar community and with my individual clients, like not that much. They're like, it depends on, you know, kind of an, it depends, but like often they're in like pick a city headquarters, like, they want a couple of pictures. They want to listen. Like I have ones that like maybe want once a year, they send a rep out and they're like, may or may not tell me, which by the way, they often don't tell you and they'll show up and they're like, how happy, but I now tell them like, let me know when you're coming and we'll like get beers on the front porch. So I can like find out what you want this year. Like I make it as inviting as possible. Like I'm like, we'll grill something, whatever, but otherwise they'll just blow through town and then another year goes by and I never see them and I have no idea how I'm doing. So I have a, like a lot less feedback and then whatever. So that, that's my, you know, like we're doing fine. And then our thing, fun thing is like neighbors and community members. We definitely get work, you know, for these sites where I'm grazing year after year, you, you want to learn who your allies are there because they'll, they'll let you know like, oh, something happened or asking answering questions about the sheep you know and those people can save you a ton of time and be really really valuable assets i mean like i don't have time to be on every facebook group in every community explaining that my sheep do not need shelter in a rainstorm or whatever it is like the latest worry is so you want to build friendships and support these people and be all happy all right Because are they, I mean, I think what you're getting to is like, they can be your maven in that community and, and, and kind of have your back on those community. Yeah. 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 
and knowing, knowing when things are fine. And when and this particularly happened this first time when I had a guardian dog, I had not had guardian dogs ever anywhere. And then I, I needed to bring one out, you know, um, this, late this summer to one site. Um, it was not ideal, but then a lot of people are like, there's a lost dog, you know, and it turns out there's a big community, this and that it's a dog in there. I was just grateful that no one cared that he barked all night long. I mean, you know, those dogs, whoa, 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 like all night long. Meanwhile, I'm like, no, we check it once a day, but I had like allies in the community who either understood farming or understood whatever grazing who stepped up, but I haven't really needed it before. Cause usually I'm the person who's explaining what I'm doing. But after you start like getting to a certain scale, you need allies and you need friends and neighbors. And so you make sure you're nice to those people because they'll, help you. And they're so glad you're there. They love, they love it. There are lots of people in my case who come and like drive specially or walk specially past the solar rays to like check on their friends, the sheep. It is cool. So. Great. Thanks. So we're, we should be wrapping this up now. We're um, close to the 60 minutes and I just wanted to give each of you uh, an opportunity. In fact, my timer is going off now. We've in fact reached the 60 minutes, but um, let's do, uh, let's just do a little in closing. Like, is there any kind of final words, nuggets of wisdom, uh, things you want to share two minutes or less for each of you? Um, uh, Byron, why don't you go first? Or uh, not. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or not. Isn't this fun? It's like Hollywood, Hollywood squares of frustration. Your internet is unstable. Your internet is unstable. Um, yeah, I, you know, briefly, I already said probably a lot of the things that are important. I, I feel like most importantly, um, just really understanding the, the site analysis of the context, right? Landscape, like, where are you? How many competitors are there? what is the average size of a land base? What is an economic unit? Like a, a thorough actual site analysis of the space you're participating in and the market rates for certain things like Lexi was alluding to. It's important to know, like if you want to provide a service and someone can mow it for $70 an acre, but it costs you $400 an acre to do it. Like you need to understand that. Right. And so just understanding more, spending more time in that and listening is really important. And I think that the, I guess the last nugget of wisdom is opportunity lies in creating workflows that are, that overcome problems for other people. And if it's a pain in the ass and it's challenging, you're, you know, that roots out competition because it is a pain in the ass. And if you develop competencies in smoothly overcoming the pain in the ass items, you know, you will have uh, more opportunities come your way and it'll be, did you get like 70% of that maybe? 50, 30? No, we, we, we got most of it. Um, and I actually, before I let you go, what, one thing that, that we talked about before that I wanted to ask you um, in this, on, the, on an upbeat note for this, um, Byron, with all of this complexity, would you own land? Oh. Ah, you're, hold um, on. Okay. Yeah, how about now? How yeah. about now? We're figuring it out. This is super fun. These people that made it through are troopers. <laughs> people that made it through are troopers. Um, no. Uh, and that's just based on my context, right? Like land is made up of layers of value, right? There's there's the grass value, there's the development value, there's the mineral value, there's the view shed, there's the relation to and proximity to cities, there's access. And um, I'm capturing the agricultural value to a certain degree. And if you want to pay for that land, you need to either monetize like some way all the different layers of value because they're constructed into it. And I don't want to be in the land business. I don't want to figure out how to run weddings in Sonoma County, which is like the only weddings and grapes are the only thing that can pay for this ground. Grape developmental values priced in at minimum $40,000 an acre. Like I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, it's just not an option. So for me, it's about learning how to develop relationships to monetize the agricultural level of value, which is just one piece of the construction of the purchase price. 
Great, thank you. Um, and Lexi, any kind of ending words of wisdom? Yeah, I think I think the the kind of thing you're like a little bit at the mercy of here is you know as we're I'm seeing a lot of people entering solar grazing or want to want to figure out how to get in is you know realizing that we're all you know, like we're, we're kind of guests, right. At these arrays, right. You know, that's, that's somewhat also another angle of how to think about it is you do want to be that competent land manager. You want to be knowledgeable, but I think you want to present like a, you want to pre present yourself like, and present like what you're offering along with, like, I come with these, these tools and resources to help you also manage this land better. Like I'm here in partnership but also in like respectful partnership because I'm not the landowner and I'm a, like, I'm also dealing with um, there's these, exp there's expensive assets that were like, we're like a little bit, I guess what I'm, we're a little bit like wanting to, we're also there to protect and keep them running well. Right. So just know that like, if you're a real control freak, you probably shouldn't solar graze. Like if you want precise management and you you're going to get upset when someone tells you they need to work on some part of the array and you got to move your flock, like don't go into targeted grazing with solar. Could do some, you could probably do something else, but if you're willing to sort of be like, I'm a partner, I'm here for the long term. I'm here to like build, build like this. We're going to build soils. We're going to do all those good things together. But you also have to realize like, you know, you're here to do all that good work and to get paid, but if you need too much control or you're too particular, like you're not in that position really. Um, and it can be great for you, great for your farm. Like you also have to have a home farm to go back to is the other place or a place to put your livestock. You know, I wouldn't do this without owning at least some land of your own or having a place that is within your control for you've got you've got sick animals, you've got whatever it is, you've got to have enough management in your system to go, oh, all right, I'm going to bring the flock home. Yeah, I got whatever it is. But you can't just be like, I'm going to buy a flock, I'm going to run them around all these solar arrays, and it's going to be great. No, you, you've got to build resiliency into your system. And you've got to build some realistic expectations of like how much work and, and your position in the game, which is you're a partner, but you're the often the junior partner until you build trust. So thank you. Yeah, thank you both. And for everyone who's watching on Whova, there is a Q&A section and both Lexi and Byron can will be able to get into that and, and answer. So if you've got questions for either of them, put them in the Q&A session. Um, they'll check back. And also, I believe both of their emails are in the speaker in their speaker bio section. So if you really got a pressing thing, you want to communicate with either of them, um, feel free to email them. I'm sure that that is fine with them. I did not ask them. <laughs> but thumbs up. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you all for, for joining us and, and thank you, Lexi and Byron for spending your, your afternoon with us. I really appreciate you guys sharing your wisdom and, and the good work that you're both doing. So um, thanks, thumbs up guys. <laughs>